returning back to those verses that we read and the verses are Isaiah chapter 51 and verses 17 to 23. The title for the message this evening is A Time to Awake. A Time to Awake. This prophecy of Isaiah is becoming more and more applicable to the moment we are in. The church is asleep. Many of the pastors are asleep. There is more than ever a need for a spiritual wake-up call. That is what this passage is. It is a, a call to awake, a call to arise out of the sleepless and the sleeplessness of sin, the the folly of sin, the darkness of sin, to awake to the righteousness of God. I want to consider with you four points in this passage. I want to look at a call or the call to awake in verse 17, the condition to astonish in verses 18 to 20, thirdly, the comfort of the Almighty in verses 21 and 22, and then fourthly, the confounding of the adversary in, verses, in verse 23. So first of all, the call to awake in verse 17. Notice, first of all, it is an emphatic call and an emphasized call. It's stated twice for emphasis. It is awake, awake. Arise, we could say. And we have this double emphasis used three times in close proximity in these verses. We have it back in verse 9. It is awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. And then in the next chapter in verse 1, it is awake, awake, put on strength, O Zion. This double emphasis is only found three times in Isaiah and all within short compass of this particular verse. Paul uses this image in the following exhortations in three letters in the New Testament. First of all, in Romans 13, verse 11, he says, Knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not. And then lastly in Ephesians 5 and verse 14, Wherefore he saith, <coughs> excuse me, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Awake. That's what we need to hear. More than that, that is what we need to do. That is what the church and this call in the Old Testament in our present passage, but also in the New Testament. The church is central, or the, the call is centrally and primarily and, and really to the church. The people of God need to awake. The people of God need to realize the time. That there's enough time in sleepless, uh, in being asleep. There's enough time in being drowsy in sin. We must wake up. It is awake, awake, but then it's a call to stand. It is stand, <clears throat> O Jerusalem. Again, it's, it's the people of God. It's, it's the city of God. We'd understand, wouldn't we, that if the call was to the world in general, but here the, the call, the need of the moment, the need of the hour is to God's people, to God's city, to the city of God, as, uh, as Augustine used that phrase. It's time to awake, time to arise. Again, Paul uses this imagery, 1 Corinthians 16 and 13, Watch, stand fast in the faith. 
Quit you like men, be strong. And one other in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In verse 13, having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, and so on. It is awake and then stand, not just awake and then lie in bed and have a rest. No, it, it's awake and stand up with purpose. And the purpose is to realize the word of God, to recognize God's call and to respond to God's call. But then notice also in this verse, to whom the call is made, we said that already, it's to Jerusalem, but then the context and the need, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury, Jerusalem had consumed, as it were, the cup of God's fury. They had become drunken at the dregs of the cup of trembling, and they wrung them out. Jerusalem had been laid low under the hand of judgment. It was a full and complete judgment. This captivity, this Babylonian captivity that still hadn't taken place as yet, this is uh, prophetic. But it was going to be seven years of full and complete judgment. And consider this, without this call, that's where they would have remained. We see that in history when God judges nations, including the northern kingdom of Israel, he judges them and they remain. They are gone under the hand of God's judgment. But now comes the effectual call to arise from this condemnation, from this fury, from the cup of trembling of God's judgment. We need God's effectual call. The men fail to guide. We see this also in Isaiah 59, this failure of the leaders of the nation, of the men of the nation, failing to guide God's people. Isaiah 59, 16 says, And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Nobody awake. Nobody taking the lead. Nobody standing in the gap, as it were, for God's people. How does that apply to today? How does that apply to this moment? When we see many in the church asleep, many pastors asleep, not taking a stand for truth, not taking a stand for righteousness, not doing their work that they are called to. You see, it says he wondered that there was no intercessor, no man to uh, take her by the hand, no man to help her, no man to guide her among all the sons that she had brought forth. Not one. Isaiah 63 verse 5 says, And I looked, and there was none to help. There was none to help. But secondly, no comfort. Verse 19. These two things are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword. By whom shall I comfort thee? The nation looked to itself. There was no hope. Today men are looking to science. That's not a bad thing in itself but people are looking to science and not to the Lord see the problem with the day is not the difficulties it is where people are looking we actually were talking about this uh, recently with uh, some others and we we're saying that 
after the, the two great wars of the 20th century, you would imagine that people would have looked to the Lord. They would have sought the Lord. But we notice after the First World War that the 20s and 30s were, were times of great ungodlessness, great sinfulness. It was the same in the 50s and 60s after the Second World War. And the, the tragic reality of these days is that people are not seeking the Lord. They're not putting their trust in God. They're not crying out to God for his help, for his comfort. And they are looking to all those things that cannot comfort, that cannot bring any peace, any help, any guidance. So no help, verse 18, no comfort, verse 19, but then no strength, verse 20. They cannot deliver the nation because they cannot deliver themselves. Verse 20 says, Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. The application is obvious, isn't it? We must recognize our utter weakness so that we cry out to the Lord for help. And this is where the uh, being alert or being awake begins. I'm just thinking at the moment of when the Lord Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave. That moment where Lazarus opens his eyes and realizes where he is. It's that moment of realization of, of where the soul is, where, where we are, and seeking the Lord's help. There is no help, there is no comfort, and there is no strength in the arm of flesh. And to look to all else but the Lord is a sign of utter depravity. And the utter, utter helplessness, yes, but the utter uh, desolation of our times. We're not using words too strongly. Our help is only... In the Lord. This is a condition to astonish. A condition to astonish. But then thirdly, the comfort of the Almighty. The comfort of the Almighty. Verses 21 and 22. Notice three things. The comfort of the Almighty, so unlike the, the, the lack of comfort, the lack of help from the men of the nation. This is a compassionate and a corrective comfort. Look at verse 21. Therefore hear now this thou afflicted and drunken but not with wine. What the Lord is doing here is he is coming to comfort, he's coming to help, but he's not ignoring the problem. He's not ignoring the great need and the, the need is this. Yes, you have been afflicted. But you've been afflicted because of your sin. You see, even those quite often who look to God for help, they want not to deal with their sin. They just want God to get them out of the situation. We talked to a man last week at the open air in Dublin City, and he was blaming God for this, that, and the other thing. And But when we talk to him of his sin he didn't want to talk see God addresses the affliction of the people because of their spiritual drunken state their spiritual uh, intoxication their sinful intoxication which is far worse than the normal kind They've been afflicted because of their sin. And therefore this needs to be challenged. This needs the corrective of God's word. But then secondly, it's an intercessory comfort. Again, verse 22. Thus saith the Lord, thy Lord, the Lord. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Thus saith thy Lord, the Lord. He's interceding as their God. And 
thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. There was no intercessor among the sons of the nation. There was no man that would take the lead. God himself would become their advocate. God himself would become their intercessor. God would plead their cause. God would plead the cause of his people. We can have no greater advocate than God himself. It's a wonderful image, isn't it? God pleading the cause of his people. God praying for you. It says of the Lord Jesus Christ that he ever liveth to make intercession for his people. This is intercessory comfort. This is an advocate coming to be our great comfort. Yes, we are guilty. Yes, we've been afflicted. Yes, we are drunken with sin. But we have a Savior. As John Newton could say on his deathbed, that he knew two things. That he was a great sinner. And Christ was a great Savior. The compassionate, corrective comfort an intercessory comfort, but then thirdly in verse 22, an able comfort. God is able to comfort. Look what it says. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. You see, God is able to take it away because he is the one that poured it out. Thou shalt, and here's a wonderful reassurance and a wonderful promise, Thou shalt no more drink it again. This is God's redeeming comfort. This is God taking away the very just judgment that had come upon the people. And when God noticed this, when God begins the work of salvation, he completes it. And that's why he says, Thou shalt no more drink of it again. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. They could not help themselves. The men could not help them. But what they could not do, the Lord would effectually do for them and in them. How would he do this? Brings us to our fourth point, which is the confounding of the adversary. In verse 23. Notice two things. As we come to a close. It is an avenging. And it is a just confounding. Verse 23 says. But I will put into the hand of them. That afflict thee. Which have said to thy soul. Bow down. That we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body. As the ground and as the street. To them that went over. God was going to become not only their intercessor, not only their advocate, but he was going to become the enemy of their enemy. God was going to become the adversary of their adversaries. He was going to avenge them justly for the sinful actions of their enemies. But this reminds us of our adversaries. We have, according to Scripture, a great adversary. We have the world. We mentioned in prayer in, at the beginning of the service, John 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? For I have overcome the world. I have overcome your adversary. Yes, you will be tried. Yes, you will suffer tribulation. Yes, you might even suffer martyrdom. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Because the Lord Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. And after that, there's nothing that they can do. The world is our adversary. But Christ has confounded the adversary. But there's another 
and that is the devil. In Hebrews 2 verse 14, it says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now get this. As he destroys the devil, verse 15 of Hebrews 2 says, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In overcoming and destroying the devil, Christ delivers his people. It goes on to say, Wherefore, verse 17, In all things it behoved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Again, we have these ideas back in our text. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, get this, he is able to succor or aid or help them that are tempted. The men couldn't help. There was no intercessor. God looked and saw that there was none that was willing or able to come forward and help his people. But Christ, the mighty arm of the Lord that we considered last week, Christ can and Christ has defeated our enemies and he's even defeating a greater enemy, the enemy within, that flesh within us, that by his spirit, he sent the spirit of God, his spirit into our hearts to crush that inward enemy, that fifth column, that enemy within, to crucify the flesh so that the world, the flesh and the devil by the work of Christ are all destroyed confounded, brought down so that the people of God might be raised up and delivered. May God bless his word to our souls in the Saviour's name. Let us sing from Psalm 68 and verses 1 to 4. Psalm 68 and verses 1 to 4. Let God arise and scattered let all his enemies be and let all those that do him hate before his presence flee. As smoke is driven, so drive thou them. As fire melts wax away before God's face, let wicked men so perish and decay. But let the righteous be glad. Let them before God's sight be very joyful. Yea, let them rejoice with all their might. To God sing, to his name sing praise. Extol him with your voice that rides on heaven by his name, Jah, before his face rejoice. Psalm 68, verses 1 to 4. Let God arise and scatter it. Let all his enemies be, and let 
to righteousness, awake to the knowledge of Christ, awake to the knowledge of sin, awake to the need of the hour, of the need of the moment, to proclaim thy praises, to reach out to those lost in sin, to bring the gospel of grace, the gospel of glory, to those who are in great need. O oh Lord, be our advocate, be our intercessor. We have no other help. We have no other refuge. We forsake all confidence except confidence in the Lord. We put our trust in thee alone. For thou art the source of all blessing, the fountain of all comfort, the foundation of all hope. And therefore we rest in the promises of God to be the helper of his people. And we give praise, honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ who came to destroy all our enemies the world, the flesh, and the devil. For Christ in himself bore our sin in his own body on the tree. And Christ defeated hell and Satan and death and all that stood opposed to his people has been vanquished and conquered by the cross, we bless and we praise the Son of God who has loved us and given himself for us. Sin had crushed us. Christ has raised us. He has led captivity captive and given gifts unto men, the greatest of all being the gift of eternal life. For this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We bless the name of our Savior. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless his name. We bless our God. O oh Lord, enable, make thy people to arise, to awake to the great need of their soul, the great need of this moment. Build up thy people, build the walls of Jerusalem. Make thy people willing in the day of thy power Fill us 
with thy strength, thy glory, thy peace and joy, the confidence that comes from knowing sins forgiven because of Christ. We bless thee and we praise thee. And now the grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the blessed Holy Spirit be with God's people. Amen.